Ah, science! Hey guys, welcome to Science This Week. Last month, I had a ton of fun dissecting the science behind some of the most iconic themes surrounding Halloween. Ghosts, witches, and Frankenstein's monster. But there was a lot that happened within our favorite topic, space and space exploration. And I thought this week I would briefly touch upon some of the more exciting news to come out of space. First up, speaking of Halloween, NASA shared some spooky images for the season. Uh, from their Twitter, actually, they wrote, When we peer deep into space, we don't expect to find something staring back at us. This photo, this galactic ghoul, as it's being called, was captured actually by the NASA Hubble, Hubble telescope and is really a head-on collision between two galaxies. The entire system in the photo by Hubble is named ARP Mador 2026 424, that wonderful scientific name. Each eye shows the core of a galaxy after it's slammed into the other, and the outline consists of young blue stars. At least that's what NASA says. NASA says the, the photographed phenomenon is actually very rare. Galaxies collide often, but not head-on, and rarely do ring galaxies form. In about one to two billion years, the two galaxies' merger will finalize. Next, a carved out cloud of gas and dust looks like a celestial jack-o'-lantern in this image from NASA's Spitzer Space Telescope. A massive star known as an O-type star and about 15 to 20 times heavier than the sun is likely responsible for sculpting this cosmic pumpkin. A recent study of the region suggests that the powerful outflow of radiation and particles from the star likely swept the surrounding dust and gas outward, creating deep gouges in this cloud, which is known as a nebula. Spitzer, which detects infrared life, saw the star glowing like a candle at the center of a hollowed out pumpkin. The study's authors have fittingly nicknamed the structure the Jack-O-Lantern Nebula. Finally, this photo shows active regions of the sun that combine to look like something of a jack-o'-lantern's face, and this is from 2014. But NASA reshared this for this Halloween season. The active regions appear brighter because those are areas that emit more light and energy, markers of an intense and complex set of magnetic fields hovering in the sun's atmosphere, the corona, as NASA wrote. Now, let's check in what's happening on the surface of the red planet. A brand new selfie taken by Mars's Curiosity rover is absolutely breathtaking. Stitched together from 57 individual images taken by a camera on the end of Curiosity's robotic arm, the panorama also commemorates only the second time the rover has performed a special chemistry experiment. This selfie was taken on October 11th, 2019 in a location named the Glen Etive, which is part of the Clay Bearing Unit, a region the team has eagerly awaited reaching since before Curiosity even launched. You can see just to the left of the rover in this image released by NASA, two holes Curiosity drilled, named Glen Et Etive 1 on the right and Glen Etive 2 on the left. The rover can analyze the chemical composition of rock samples by powderizing them with a drill, then dropping the samples into a portable lab in its belly called Sample Analysis at Mars, or SAM. Clay-based rocks are good at preserving chemical compounds, which break down over time and when bombarded by radiation from space and the sun. The science team is therefore really intrigued to see which organic compounds, if any, have been preserved in the rocks at Glen Etev. Understanding how this area formed will give them a better idea of just how the Martian climate was changing billions of years ago. The results from this study will be known next year. Astronomers have made some exciting discoveries about Saturn, and that planet has now overtaken Jupiter as our solar system's satellite king. Astronomers just discovered 20 previously unknown Saturn's moons, boosting the ringed planet's tally of known satellites to 82, three more than that of Jupiter. And there's even more exciting news. You can help name these newfound objects. I'll put the link in this show, but if you just want to Google name Saturn's moons, you can go on over to carnegiescience.edu and help name those moons. All 20 moons are tiny, measuring about three miles across. 
17 of them have retrograde orbits, and this means that they move around Saturn in the opposite direction to the planet's rotation. These 17 all take more than three Earth years to complete one lap around Saturn, and the most far-flung one is the most distant Saturn satellite even known. Scott Shepard of the Carnegie Institution for Science in Washington, D.C. said this kind of grouping of outer moons is also seen around Jupiter, indicating violent collisions occurred between moons in the Saturnine system or with outside objects such as passing asteroids or comets. Using some of the largest telescopes in the world, we are now completing the inventory of small moons around the giant planets. They play a crucial role in helping us determine how our solar system's planets formed and evolved. For example, the newfound moon's existence suggests that the impacts that created them occurred after Saturn was fully formed. The gas giant was surrounded by a disk of dust and gas as it was taking shape. If these tiny moons had to plow through all that material on their way around Saturn, friction would have sapped their speed and sent them spiraling into the planet. Next up, new spacesuits have finally been revealed from NASA that will be the ones worn by the astronauts as part of the Artemis mission, our mission to Moon and then to Mars. When astronauts are hours away from launching on Artemis missions to the Moon, they'll put on these brightly colored orange spacesuits called the Orion Crew Survival System, or OSCC suit. It is designed for a custom fit and equipped with safety technology and mobility features to help protect astronauts on launch day in emergency situations, high-risk parts of missions near the moon, and during the high-speed return to Earth. While shuttle-era spacesuits came in off-the-shelf sizes like small, medium, and large, the Orion suits will be custom fit for each crew member and accommodate astronauts of all sizes. Even though it's primarily designed for launch and re-entry, the Orion suit can keep astronauts alive if Orion were to lose cabin pressure during the journey out to the moon while adjusting orbits and gateway or on the way back home. Astronauts could potentially survive inside the suit for up to six days as they make their way back to Earth. These will pair with a separate suit designed specifically for prolonged exposure outside in space. Speaking of spacesuits, NASA reached a milestone when two American astronauts ventured out of the International Space Station to perform a spacewalk and replace a failed power controller. The astronauts, Christina Cook and Jessica Meir, were the first to take part in an all-woman spacewalk. Video footage from the astronauts' helmet cameras as they dangled 260 miles above Earth provided a live stream of the painstaking operation to carry the new hardware, install it, and then return the faulty battery to the airlock for a post-mortem back on Earth into why it failed. Speaking on an all-female spacewalk, this was bound to happen because of the increasing number of female astronauts. And at the end of the day, they are all just astronauts, but this milestone shouldn't be looked upon lightly or with PC culture ire and disdain. Women were not admitted into the astronaut program until 1978, and an American woman did not fly into space until Sally Ride did it in 1983. Two Soviet women actually preceded her. The first spacewalk took place in 1965, but in 1984, Catherine Sullivan became the first American woman to perform one. Of the more than 560 people who have been in space around the world, only 65 have been women. Christina Cook is due to remain on the ISS until February, bringing her total time in space to 328 days, the longest single spaceflight by a woman, and just short of Scott Kelly's titanic 340-day record. Researchers are collecting extensive biomedical data on the impact of spaceflight on Cook's body. The bodies of men and women differ, and this is something that not only needs to be studied on Earth, but in space as well. A uh, perfect example is that men and women's bodies sweat differently. And when you're on a spacewalk, a spacesuit is specifically designed to maintain the body's temperature at safe levels. And this is with cooling and ventilation within the suit. But this was designed specifically for the male body. This is something that is being addressed with the new Artemis designs and beyond with space exploration. And it is really interesting as we find out more about the physiology and what happens to everybody's body with prolonged time in space.
So starting next week, I'll be bringing you a multi-part series on the science of humanity in space. I hope to do an in-depth look at how humans exist in space and go through the science of the space suit, the spacewalk or EVA, the space station itself, and the various rovers and vehicles that humanity has used and will be using in the emptiness of space. So I can't wait for you guys to join me on that journey starting next week right here on the science segment on Fueled by DeathCast.